Well, I've just come up to see how Mike's uh, getting on with his, his bushcraft camp he's uh, doing up here in the woods. And as I'm walking up, I've never been up this footpath. Well, it's actually a footpath, it's sort of a right of way access uh, driveway. I've never been up this one before. But this, no question, this is new and absolutely gargantuan. I'm guessing it's an ash tree that's gone over. It is absolutely huge. Absolutely. Quite, I would assume, a shallow root system. As you can see, it's going to, it's going to break away here. They're going to have to reinforce down there because every time something drives past it, it's going to push like this. All that in there. You've doubtless gathered the weather is superb. The sensible Graham has brought a folding umbrella with him. Don't leave home without it. So that one's like the one that Mike had go down years ago, you can see. So there's loads of wood there. Shame to see them go, it must be a hundred and something feet tall. I wonder why they're all going over. I know they get ash die back, but you're so sheltered in here from the wind, it's difficult to believe. You know, where's the wind coming from? I think I'll keep moving in case another one comes down. I think he's up here with Jacks. I think he's building, or oh, was, I don't think he will this rain. A camp kitchen or something, but uh, I think it's rain stop play. I just had paperwork this morning. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't leave. I've got to get the paperwork, get the business sorted first, and I'll maybe grab a few hours. But I don't even know if it's going to work. I think his begins uh, up here somewhere. You see all the bluebells just died back here now. As has the. Uh, Wild well, garlic, that's all gone. This is a normal path. I'll come back on. I wonder if they're absolutely soaking. I'm amazed the dog hasn't kicked off with me here yet. Man walking along with a strange. There he goes. He's seen the umbrella. <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> Here he comes. Oh no, he's coming. Brrr. Boop, boop, boop. Ah, it's the baby. It's the baby. Soaking wet. What are you doing, baby? What are you doing? Don't bark at me. I'm a friend. I'm the one that gives you naughty biscuits when Michael's not looking. Yeah. Come on. Come and show me where you've been. Let's go. Go on. Well, I followed the dog, he obviously knows where the dry spot is. Well, I can't thank you enough for the invitation. Rain has affected play. <laughs> yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I could have stayed at home and done all the bills. <laughs> I got gas. I did think that. As soon as I got here, it started raining. Gas, electric. And I thought, oh, Dad's, uh, I've timed this badly inviting you to the woods. He's mousing already. He's mousing away. This tarp's been brilliant, though. Yeah, I'm amazed he's still here. That's the first time I've walked up that drive. Oh, the main track? Yeah, you I know. What do you think of the ruts? Well, it's sort of dry now, aren't they? Yeah, it's up here, it's bad. Big tree gone down, isn't it? Is there? Oh, massive. What, well, big as yours? Across the track? No, right by the driveway. It's going to pull all the drive out. Oh, has it fallen recently? Yeah, oh, yeah, I'll tell you. What do you think? There's one in there. Do you think there's one in there? Yeah, big one. Yeah, what I'm really grateful for this tarp. So what I mean, is... The cabin is immaculately dry. Bone dry, you know, lovely, yeah. I've unlocked it, so it's, uh, it's so dry. You but, can't believe how much wood we've got through making stuff. Oh, it's, yeah, that cabin ate most of it, but we do have tons of posts for... Oh, he's wet there. For posting. <laughs> for posts, sir. So you were saying you had uh, ticks on him last time? Uh, yeah, no, no, on me. He didn't have any. Oh, really? He's got this medication where if they bite him, they die. They fall off and die, whereas you, I don't. But so anybody in the woods, really, especially in the summer, needs to check themselves. Hundred the percent. I check daily. Like if I'm in the woods, you want you want tight fitting clothes like here, round round your wrists. Lycra? No, yeah. just just tight fitting. Like if you've got um, like a thermal layer or something. Yeah. Just tight fitting under there and tight fitting around your ankles. And so people that tuck I their trousers into their socks aren't so stupid. <laughs> yeah. 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 The happy camper look is yeah. actually. Wow. Could be worse, guys. I could be fishing. <laughs> Cat insensible, look, bringing an umbrella. 
I always keep two folding ones, those little folding ones in the car. So those of you might remember, if you follow Mike's GA Outdoors, is where the huge That's gap is. And this is what is going to be the bushcraft camp. Yep, this is it. With the, with the ash, ash tree at the centre as a feature. I quite like it, I've got to sort maybe a little roof over it or something. Might have a bit of a problem with the fire today. Yeah, yeah, that's not happening today, is it? I think we'll avoid fire. Yeah, it's nice big. You can see the huge void it's cleared. This wiped out all those, it went all the way. All the way, 100 feet or more, yeah. Yes. Those hazel got flattened and look how they've grown up even after it. Yeah. Yeah, I bought some fishing line because I thought you could go round where they're all down and just tie them together in a bunch to give them a bit of support, you know? Yeah, I'm but, just going to use them all for the camp. That's but, but, I, but I can see that they've grown up, they've yeah. got sap in them and then pulled back up again. So this is the kitchen bit, this is what I'm thinking here. There's a frame here, another smaller frame like that, that one's broken, but yeah. a smaller frame here. Lean to coming out here with the planks on the roof, shelf here, and then this is the area for the kitchen, chopping meat, prepping, and then Carving we're near anything. the cooking, and then a log store underneath it. So the shelf's here, yeah. then we split all the logs, put them under there, and they stay dry then, because they're getting wet all the time. So that's the plan anyway. I'm just trying to flatten this ridge, this top bit off, to, uh, have some batten things on it. Yeah, you need tarp up to work there, don't you? Well, trouble. I've got the big tarp, it's, we can make it work. I've got cordage. You've had a go by the look of it here, yeah? This is, no, that's just to tie, hold this up so I can frame it. Oh, I see, yeah. Well, I'm going to go and check the cabin out, see yeah. what that looks like. I'll be chipping away with the axe. So it's a bit grim, but we're going up just to check on the cabin. The dogs, Jets and Dogs is coming with me. My God, look at this wild garlic, it's just... I'm so pleased I photographed it when I did, people. The flowers have gone totally. The bluebells have gone totally. And to be honest, Mike came back, back in the spring, obviously, this was. I said to the wife, I've got to drive all the way back another oh, it's an hour and a half. And I said, I've got to photograph. I'm so pleased I did. Hopefully, I'll show you guys later what the stunning colours look like. This is trail camera. So here, still standing, a work of art. And of course, the idea of leaving an overhang like that is perfect because it is bone dry here. Don't think it's going to be falling down in a hurry. All still good. God, what weather. Where's the dog? Here. Doggy. He'll be under. There he is. He's mousing. And same with the back, we've got an overhang at the back. He's got some more timber left. <laughs> He's gone underneath. <laughs> He's gone under there. <laughs> Oi, get out. <laughs> Have you got a license for that? Don't worry, there will be somebody who says, Oh, you've got a license to use it. You've got commission. And a nice handle. He's straight under there. You bet your life there's mice under there. You might find it slightly dark in here. Got all these tools here, you know. It's a nice tool store, you might might not see it. Absolutely bone dry. I've got to get a bolt put on there, just in case the wind does catch it. So I guess we're gonna go back, get wet, and uh, try and get a start on his uh, bushcraft camp kitchen there. At least get a tarp up, I think that's the first thing. God, I hope this stops. Another session of rain stop play, guys, but uh, it's just the way it is. We were just saying Mike's had this tarp up over the timber here for about six months. Do you have to wax these with proof or anything like no, that? No, these ones you just leave, they're, light, they're super lightweight like a sill nylon um, tarp, they're just really lightweight. Obviously it means that they can rip easier than like an oil skin or waxed canvas one, but they pack down so small and they're really lightweight. And they're just doing the job, all I've got is a stick up the middle, in the middle there, just to give it the pitch. Four sticks on the outside, or two sticks that side, tied to two trees, dropping the corners, and then the rain can all just run off. And Some of the wood gets a bit and wet. And this is like a sealed hinge here, so you could make a back to it, couldn't you? Make it 90 oh, yeah, degrees? Yeah, yeah. You could, you could drop yeah it's it all the reinforced. Back. You see the reinforced points? They're tie out points, they're all reinforced. Yes. There's obviously a you know what under there. There's a creature. Oh, 
Oh, God. Oh, what is that? What the? Don't come out of here. Have you seen that? Oh, my God, it's the sun. I thought it was going to fry like those vampires do. My God, it's been tipping down for like half an hour. You can see the camp kitchen's coming along here. Now, this is wide angle. So, so it's not actually bowed like that. It's what's called parallax problem. These saws guys are called silky saws and they only work on the pull, not the push. Anybody does gardening work, I believe they use them a lot, sort of pruning saws there, they call them. Someone's stolen the axe. I'm figuring we need to drive a stake in here, guys, and just give it an extra support at the back there. Got it, I think. Yeah. So, people, we are locked up for the night. We have got, as you can see, or not see, because we just covered it over with a tarp, what we've done. The start of the bushcraft kitchen using Mike's um, leftover the, of the old ash tree that went down. As you can see, it's all covered over now. We've built the framework. And this is all ash, solid one inch thick that Ryan, our tree surgeon, cut down and made out of it. We've got some left over. We've got an edge to it. You're going to see more of this on Mike's channel, TA Outdoors. He'll be doing a, a sort of full build of this. And that's somewhere, as you can see, in the... Um, Bushcraft camp, he can have the, he's got the fire there, he's got all the surround, he's probably going to adapt this and move it and make it a bit wider. But I have to tell you, you know I'm a fisherman, I am not really a bushcrafter. I love the outdoors, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't be here otherwise, would I? Especially in the rain. But I went to one of the uh, bushcraft shows last year to help Mike out because he had a stand there. I found it really, really interesting. Now I did put some films up last year, I've got other bits of footage I didn't put up, so I'm going to cobble them together because it's all about traditional skills, not just necessarily woodcraft and cooking and stuff like that. They're just people who love the outdoors and they're looking at traditional outdoor skills that I found fascinating. I'm going to run it on after this, put the clips together, maybe a bit of music, I don't know what I'm going to do. So don't go away, it's a bit of chill out time and I'll tell you what, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there as well. I thoroughly enjoyed myself at that show and the weather was good and it didn't rain. Let's go and watch it. Oh, no. I want to get that line first. <laughs> well, when I woke up, she was looking at me. She told me I've been cheating on her in her dream.
I'm over here, I'm here with Dr. James Tilly, and he could make all my fishing leads as far as I'm concerned because he would be concerned, I say, I would confirm him as a master caster. That's what I'm going to call him. So, James, give us a run through on bronze casting. So, for the casting that I've been doing with people at the show here, they've been making a small Bronze Age actor from the early Bronze Age, which conveniently I have in my pocket here. Uh, this is an axe head that would have come from the Ariton phase of the Bronze Age about 4,000 years ago when Stonehenge fell into its final phases. But to get to that they have to make a mould and the moulds that we've been using today have been these sand moulds and I have half of one here. Now this has a steel frame with a natural sand interior that is the mould medium. In the Bronze Age they probably would have used a clay or a stone mould but for the workshop that only lasts two and a half hours to make a clay mould, dry it, fire it or carve stone would just simply be too long. So for the sand moulds they could be made within 10 minutes and are ready to go straight away. But the whole process to go from the moulding the bellowing to use the charcoal in the clay crucible to melt the bronze which is copper and tin for true bronze still takes a long process and it will give people here at the show an idea of perhaps one of the earliest tools of the bushcrafter the bronze axe so for the furnace it needs to be around about 1200 degrees. Uh, I can measure the outside of the fuel around the crucible but not know the temperature inside the crucible itself where the metal is. So having a pyrometer and thermocouple gives me some idea of the temperature but to be honest because it's so rough, the best guide is the glow of the coals, the embers themselves. And that's exactly how they would have done it in the Bronze Age. And by taking off the lid of the crucible, I can see if it's liquid enough. For a Bronze Age furnace, it probably would have been a pit in the ground lined with clay that would need several days of dry weather before you even used it. But for this freestanding furnace, uh, it's much safer and uh, if you accidentally catch your leg on it as you walk past, it's absolutely cold and well insulated, but the process is exactly the same otherwise. And it sets pretty fast as opposed to say, well, I make my fishing nets, it, it sets in what, do you say 10 seconds, 15 seconds? Well, yeah, the casting is where the pressure is, but uh, it's all done and over in a matter of seconds. Once the crucible's out, uh, you have to be very quick. Although the crucible will keep the metal liquid, as soon as it starts to come out of the crucible, it will solidify in around 10 seconds or so. So it's a very rapid motion. You have to be confident in your pour, whereas something like lead that has a much lower melting temperature and uh, be much closer to an ambient room temperature will hold as a liquid for far longer. And I noticed on the uh, film here that the, you can open the mould pretty rapidly really, it does go off really quickly. Yeah, it, it is solid, well within seconds and uh, it's a case of when you want to open it really, whether it's the first couple of seconds and the mould bursts into flames with the oil burning or whether you're happy to wait um, and uh, it'll just be uh, still quite hot and needs a, a good sizzling quench to, and you can handle you don't, it. You don't, you, you say you don't quench it immediately? Straight in, you do it if graduation. If it's still glowing red, um, you don't want to quench it too quickly because heat tension cracks can appear in the freshly cast object and you certainly wouldn't want any cracks in something like an axe or hammer. So then it's just a question of filing a little edge to the uh, front of the blade? Yeah, filing, work hardening and even decorating uh, to make it a true example of an early Bronze Age axe head.
Guys, and I, I know a lot of you people follow us with the uh, fishing boats on the TA Fishing Show or anything boaty. So I'm here at Mike's. Well, we show I'm helping him out. But I'm here to see Mark at New Haven Coppice. He's making a boat as well. You guys might be interested in it. It's not just any old boat. It's a boat made out of an enormous piece of forest. Let's see how Mark's getting on. So Mark, while you're chiseling and whittling away, give, yeah, us, yeah. give us a rough idea, you know, what you're uh, intending to do over a period of three days <laughs> here at the Bushcraft Show. Uh, okay, so this is a, a lovely, knotty, gnarly old bit of lime that we've got brought up from Somerset. Um, and we're converting it over the course of um, three days into a canoe, a dugout canoe. Um, so this is the third canoe that I've done. But this one's going to be a bit special, a bit different, because we're going to um, we're actually going to try and expand it. So uh, there was a tradition um, in the early kind of uh, Viking period and in the Iron Age, um, and still present in Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania, where they hollow out a log and then they light a big fire underneath it and they expand the top open to make a, a bigger canoe from a, from a smaller log. So it's kind of a more efficient process of creating a more kind of graceful vessel than the kind of standard dugout canoe. Oh, Design-wise, does this come off the piece at the front? So these are quite crucial actually. So you imagine when you were steaming this, um, this log later on, and hopefully tomorrow, um, we're going to be bending the sides out um, and there's a huge amount of force that's put on the grain. Um, and so these bits here will be clamped, clamped together with, uh, with wood and bound really tightly and that will stop the whole log from splitting apart. Um, well, that's, that's the theory, so hopefully that will save us I'm doing all this work and then ruining it at the last minute. Well, I did get shot of you yesterday. You're doing plenty of axe work to get the start yeah. of the shape, so your main one is to get the basic shape of what type of axes, you know, the names of the axes, you know, so people know what you start with. Yeah, yeah, well, most of the work... Um, uh, it's been done with yeah, just a, a, a normal kind of double bevelled uh, uh, axe and there's a few over there and um, there's a Kent pattern that I've been using quite a lot of three and a half pound Kent axe um, but then um, you know each each different bit may require kind of slightly different axes we've used a couple of side axes for um, shaping the kind of uh, the finer bits um, yeah so here we go <coughs> so this is just kind of a, a, a an old kind of a three and a half pound Nash uh, it's got a Kent pattern, it's kind of very characteristic. And this is really lovely for, for swinging, swinging all day long. It's not too heavy, um, but it's got enough weight behind it that you can really chunk out the kind of waste wood. What weight would that be, yeah. the head? Three and a half pounds. Three and a half pounds, yeah. 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 So for some people it feels quite heavy, but yeah. um, really when you're swinging it down, you want that weight to kind of give it a bit of power. So that's, um, that's a lovely, lovely tool for, um, for, uh, for working the wood. Um, and then this is my little side axe. Um, so this is actually based on an early medieval axe. Um, it was made by a friend of mine in Devon called Dave Budd. Um, is that Dave of the blacksmith that I that filmed is, previously? Yeah, 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 exactly. The world famous Dave Budd. That is the world famous the, the Dave knight, Budd. The knight blacksmith, I'm calling him. <laughs> he should be knighted. He's, he's an incredible guy, yeah. So he's an experimental archaeologist like me. He specialises in, in, in steel and, and metal working. So anyway, he made this axe for me and I've, I've used it for the last uh, six or seven years now. Um, so it's kind of... Yeah, part of the part of the family. Um, yeah. So this was a really lovely axe to use, and um, has, has, has kind of proved proved very useful on this on this axe on this canoe. Um, what we um, we have been playing with as well, uh, being kind of the mad experimental archaeologists that we are. Um, oh wow! Uh, we, Flintstones. Yeah, exactly. So, so Flintstone had one of those. So this is a, a Neolithic axe made by Will Lord. Uh, he made the head, I just made the handle for it. Flint? Uh, is that, yeah, it's flint, flint, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so I polished the edge, I've just given that a polish by rubbing it on a, on a bit of sandstone, and that kind of preserves the edge a bit better. So we use these in our woodland for um, bits of experimental archaeology, and um, yesterday Tim had a go using it on this, and it, you know, it's surprising. It doesn't shatter, I'm amazed it doesn't just shatter. Huh? No, absolutely not. So, yeah, by polishing that edge, you kind of preserve, preserve yeah. the kind of the strength and the shape of the, of the tool. Um, and the shaft, what would that be? What, it's all ash. Yeah, it's all ash. ash. Yeah. So you want a really nice. That's why it looks a bit flintstoney because you can see how it wants to split the yeah. end by having a really nice knotty bit there. It kind of keeps, oh stops the split running yeah, exactly. down the wood. Exactly. Oh yeah. wow. So um, so anyway, last night uh, we had fun with our, our neighbours here and we were making bronze tools. Um, so we use bronze tools quite a bit. We've dropped big trees in our woodland with, with bronze tools. Um, 
So uh, this is just an early Bronze Age style axe. Um, we're going to give this a go later on, but also we're going to be handling the axe we made last night and be using that on, on, on the canoe as well. So that's later on, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so later so on. So now is, I'm calling that spoke shave, but it you're, you're going to tell, oh, it is a spoke yeah, shave. Yeah, yeah, so we've got a spoke shave. Yeah, yeah, Miranda. Those, using... My sessions at the secondary modern woodwork class <laughs> weren't totally wasted. Absolutely, so we've been using a draw knife and a spoke shave just to um, get a nice smooth finish on the outside of the canoe. So obviously this is the underside. We'll be turning it over in a minute to start hollowing it out. Um, but we want a really nice curve here so that when we start steaming it, there's no kind of pressure point, no sharp angles where it might snap and, and crack. So um, there's going to be a lot of kind of, yeah. That's a just, laborious job. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it's very satisfying. Like the feel of the wood is absolutely yeah. lovely. Um, yeah, so that's the plan. Keep keep shaving it, keep shaping it. Um, and then yeah, hollow it. In a minute, we'll be turning it over and starting to hollow it out where the hard work comes in again so this is a nice little relief this morning so it's, it's, it's big axe work again for the yeah, we'll be, oh, no, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll be using using the axes but also using some adzes that I've had made up yeah. um, by my friend in Devon uh, Tom Toogood who runs Long Dog Smithy he'll be um, I rang him up on Monday and desperately asked him for a couple of adzes and he, uh, he graciously made them for me at the last minute so um, we'll be using those to, to chip out the inside yeah <laughs> What exactly is inside? The, 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 That's just a yeah. weight to stop it from toppling. But it's just some... I thought it was something exclusive and rare and unusual and, <laughs> and you lit it or something.
So I'm coming into uh, the prehistoric experience tent. It's indeed an experience, and Sarah here is going to tell us what to do with a cow's gut. Various bits of <laughs> bladder, of all sorts, deers, intestine. Guts. Yeah, intestines. So this bit of intestine here is actually, I think it's basically the bit that would be the appendix on a human, but on a cow because of the, their diet, it's huge. And uh, you've got two usable sections to it. You've got, it's closed off at one end, and so I've cut that bit off, and that's a, a one piece bag that's Storage, waterproof. anything storage? Yeah, this has got pemmican in because it's it's mostly grease proof. Um, so that's what I've used those for. And then the rest of this, I haven't decided what I'm going to do with it yet, but I, probably some kind of uh, waterproof coat. That's the plan. So, so how, how would you, I mean, to, to get to this stage you've got at the moment, what would you do? Tanning wise or you, the same as a hide? Similar. You inflate them with air, so they're like a giant balloon, and you let them dry and then tan them in in tannin. This was actually from tea bags. I used oh, I see. huge numbers of, of tea bags um, and the, the tannin soaks into the, the material over a number of weeks. And then you have to soften them. So you get them out and let them start to dry, oil them, pull and stretch and pull and stretch and soften them. So I've got 50 or 60 of these at home. Wow. And uh, I haven't yet decided what I'm going to do with them. This this one's um, this one's a scraper and the thing that tells me it's a scraper is this edge here. Don't you see that there? So this side uh, is not great but it's it's not been flaked at all really. But flakes have been bashed off this way to leave a sort of semicircle which can be used for scraping hides. Oh I see that way, yes yeah. That yeah. way. And and they're one of the things that if you're going to find a flint tool, chances are you'll find scrapers more than anything else, more than arrowheads, definitely more than, than axes and things. Now all of these but one are, are sort of modern replicas that we've just made so we can hand them around, but this one is quite special. That's at least one and a half million years old and that's from South Africa. And I just love the idea that you're holding something that was handled by one of our ancestors that long ago there's something really quite magical about it and i love that i can hand this round to the kids um so hand axes are butchery tools and they are brilliant so this this one here has been used to take apart a whole red deer so th this one i believe is more of a again it's a bronze age style one so the the fishtail one is is specific to denmark i don't think they've really been found anywhere else um but this one is, is more the style that we occasionally find in Britain. It's like a beaker style dagger. And sometimes they they had, probably, the handle was just bound with string straight around the flint, or you could put a, an actual handle on them. Um, and it's, it's one of those- What wood would they use? What sort of wood would they just like? Pine or would they go for oak? I don't know, I don't know whatever, whatever they had. This yep. is half of a young mammoth's tooth. Not a baby, but more sort of like an adolescent. So the, the full tooth would have been about this big. They only had about four teeth at a time. But the, the fully grown woolly mammoth teeth could be up to up to double the size. Massive great things. Um, this came out of the North Sea. So that's about 30,000 years old off the, off the Dogger Bank kind of area. With a talk about, I think, an expedition guy over there. He's telling you about his uh, expedition up the Zambezi or somewhere. I've got an expedition. It's over to the mead stall and talk to the gentleman who has mead apparently on tap. The oldest alcoholic drink is making a comeback for the oldest man here. That's me. That's me. <laughs> so, guys, here I am. I am at the traditional oak aged mead. I won't be able to say that. Stone Circle Mead Company. Stone Circle Mead Company, as you can see. Various different flavours. So how is mead made? Okay, so it's uh, uh, traditionally by fermentation, not the uh, the fortified version that you can often come across in supermarkets and whatnot. It's uh, fermented traditionally with uh, with yeast, and um, so of course a lot of the sugars are turned to alcohol, uh, and this is what we get. So now this would be sold by the cask, by the bottle. How would you? How would people buy this? They would have um, well. Here we go. How do you sell it? Here we go. In the horn. Oh. Now, if you were uh, in uh, Anglo-Saxon times, uh, you'd come into someone's home and you'd be presented with a mead horn, full of mead, absolutely to the brim. And the whole thing is that, of course, if you spill a drop of this, it's a mortal insult to your host. Oh. So what have you got to do with this? If you give it to you, you've got to drain the whole thing. OK, 
Okay. So would that come under the classification of almost a beer? No. Well, um, it's not. Okay, a lot of people make this mistake. Yeah, that's um, what I'm asking. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, when, when you take honey out of the hive, the, yeah. f- the, the, the free-flowing honey was used for food. It was a delicacy. The, the pressings from the combs you turn into mead and the washings where you literally get the honeycomb and dunk it in a, bu- in a bucket of water and then wrap it around, get the last bits of honey out. That was turned into honey beer or braggots in English, braggot in the Welsh. And that's uh, what we call small beer. That's what they, they, they drink instead of water because the water in towns you couldn't drink. Uh, so this would be... A pint would be strong. Is it like cider? Is it strong? No, it's uh, it's. Th- this would be the the uh, the drink for feasts and high days and holidays for the nobility to drink. So it's a very posh drink. Uh, the beer, the honey beer, would have been for the for the the hoi polloi or the, really? the rest of really? it. Yeah. Am I am I classified as a hoi polloi? I think. No, you're, you're, you're. What do you think? Uh, is it worth me having a totally awesome fishing sample? <laughs> I mean, would you buy a fishing rod? Would you buy a fishing rod and not want to test it? Would you want to buy some maggots and tell it? No, you wouldn't, would you? No. No. Here so you this go. is what so it looks like. Here we go. So there's a little thimbleful for you. There we go. So that was, what did I just drink then? That was the traditional. So it's honey, water, yeast, but it's a silly lemon. This one's the old serum, which is made with cooking apples and honey. Yeah. So this is more medieval in style. So they would have crushed up whatever fruits, flowers were in season at the time, mixed it with the honey, and make the honey go further, add complexity, add flavour. Ah, so suggestion. try this one. Now, just to point out, guys, so one, two, three, four, five, there's six barrels I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a different taste. Isn't it? Very different. And yeah. that one's really good with so strong cheeses. And No, no, that's, uh, that's a medieval style one that's made with cooking apples. So we'll try on the big three. How about that? that just is, get that was, one that more. That was different. I'll tell you, uh, probably for me, let's do it that way. Probably for me, that was uh, more. I, I like the taste of that one better. Yeah. Do you like a dry? Uh, is that more yeah, I, like, I have dry wines, but so it's, uh, well, if let's you try don't mind. A uh, really dry one. That's, uh, okay. That's our Plum and Damson, which is uh, um, obviously it's got the astringency of the plum in it. If you can imagine yeah. eating a plum, it's got a bit of. Uh, uh, don't get the smell of it, but then. No. Yes. No. Number number two. That's your. <laughs> yeah, I would take that number two. Yeah. I really yeah. like the 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 apple one with uh, strong cheeses or duck and goose that kind of thing. Yeah. It's got the acidity to it, so it, it cuts. You know. But this one. Uh, yeah. Is the granddaddy of mulled wines. Where they got the idea from for mulled wine. So when they stopped being able to get hold of spiced mead, they started yeah. putting spices in red wine. So this is the granddaddy of that. Should I take it or not, guys? Listen, I've been watching Michael stand for ages in the rain. I, I feel I deserve it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's totally different. Different again. That is yeah. absolutely different, isn't it? So you can serve that one cold, um, but you can also... It, Thank it, you very much. It'd be the traditional Anglo-Saxon winter warmer. So you'd give, get a cup of hot yeah. mead given to you as you, when you walk in to someone's uh, home. You'd be presented with a cup of hot mead and it would chase the winter away. It's a sort of... Clovey, like cloves. It's got cloves in it. Yeah, oh, it's got cloves in it. Yep. Come Anything on, else? Totally denuded of yeah. taste. No. Nope. That's brilliant. No, Cinnamon, brilliant. nutmeg, cloves, and ginger. Yeah. Other oh, four spices. Good. Yeah. So, how long have you been uh, working on this? As I say, well, I've been making mead for the past thirty-five years, on and off. Uh, started in Llangollen in North Wales in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, started the company again a few years ago, and uh, just recently opened our new meadery in Wrexham. And how old would that be, you know, when you say recent? Because it takes time to prepare everything? It does. It takes us two and a half, two, two and a half years to get it into the bottle. Wow. So it's a, lo- it's a real labour of love. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it takes a long time to ferment, and then you've got to uh, chill it down, you've got to age it in oak, and age it in the bottle, and yeah. all the whole thing's a very long process. And mead is, it just takes its sweet time, yeah. literally. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I'm on the other side of the stand now. And look who's rocked up to get served. I mean, it's not fair, is it? Look, 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 so look, is, look, look, look. What's all this about? What's all this about? <laughs> the uh, cinnamon nutmeg. Thank you very much. I like that. That's a nice sort of That's wintery. Yeah. yeah. Crop. You can warm that up. Or yeah. Add it over ice. It's almost like a mould. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, that's the granddaddy of mould wine. Yeah. It's nice. Is that, where it originated that, that, that's, from. The, that's the best one. Oh, yeah. Right. That's the one you liked. This one's the one I like, which is the rhubarb. But the Yule is pretty much predominantly most people's favourite because they always like it. Yeah, no worries, Mike. Yeah. Um, 
because so. it's Christmas, that touch of Christmas. Yes, yes, I see it, but then, yeah. People yeah. tend to think, yes, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, it's yeah. that, and that is where it originated from. Yeah.